Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today with us. I'm Natalie Lacum, the Marketing Associate at BookNet Canada. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Joshua Talent. Joshua is an acclaimed teacher and guide on the role of data in publishing and a vocal advocate for high-quality book metadata. He serves up as the Director of Sales and Education at Firebrand Technologies, where his focus is on helping publishers of all sizes learn about and find solutions to their workflow and metadata problems. Joshua can often be found researching all metadata issues, creating training videos and documentation about Firebrand services and speaking at conferences about the latest innovations and advances in publishing data and workflow management. So now without further ado, I will pass things off to Joshua. All right. Thank you guys for joining us today. I'm really glad to uh, have this opportunity to speak to you on behalf of BookNet Canada. And, and uh, while it's sad that the Tech Forum Conference was not able to go forward, this is, uh, this is a very great opportunity. I'm very excited about today's webinar. I have a lot of slides, a lot of details, a lot of information I want to share, so let's just dive right in. So one of the publishers that we work with here at Firebrand has seen a tenfold increase of their Amazon revenues since 2012 and a 42% increase in sales uh, in 2019 alone. So that increase is a direct result of the company taking a more active role in managing their book data and watching their titles on Amazon and other retailers. And they did that with only one person working on managing their data and advertising processes. As a matter of fact, that same company saw a 63% year-over-year increase in sales on Amazon in April, despite the coronavirus, and 107% increase in May, again, year-over-year, and again, despite the pandemic. And Amazon continued to order their books throughout the crisis. Uh, I believe that that resiliency is due not only to the nature of the books that the publisher sells and the desire for consumers to buy those kinds of books, but also due to the fact that they worked very hard to increase the quality of their data and to actively address issues and opportunities that they have been confronted with over the last few years. So what I would like to do today is to help you understand how you too can, cause, uh, can use data to impact your own sales of your books. To start off, we're gonna talk about why metadata is important. I'm gonna share with you some practical information about how metadata is utilized in the major online book sites. And then after that, I'm gonna share four data challenges that I'm seeing publishers encounter on a daily basis. And lastly, I'm going to end with some practical and actionable suggestions that I hope will help you take home, uh, you'll be able to take home and start implementing right away. So we've all heard that your metadata is important and that your metadata affects sales. But sometimes I kind of wonder if that message is sinking in. Uh, it may seem like we kind of, you know, continually say this over and over again, and it doesn't really make a difference. But I think metadata actually is very important. According to the best estimates, the percentage of online book purchases has increased from 20% to 50% in just the last nine years. Now, this means that while your book's presence in bookstores is very important, your online listings are just as important, if not more so. And in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, I suspect that online book sales will continue to take a larger piece of the pie than they have in the past. Also, don't forget that the metadata that you send is not just about online sales, since brick and mortar stores acquire and position books based on the same data. So it's important to remember your data is not just about online. Also, online buyers consistently use search engines to find books. That includes uh, both Amazon and Google, both of which can be impacted greatly by the quality and the quantity of your metadata. Search engines run on data, and the more data you give them uh, of the correct type and the correct quality, uh, the better the search results are going to be. Another important point to make here is that the number of books actively available in the marketplace is growing, and your backlist and the backlist of other publishers is not going away. With the advent of print-on-demand, you can keep a backlist title alive for many more years than you ever could before. And that means that making your books stand out is that much more important than it was before as well. Okay, so th those are some compelling details, but what's the connection to metadata specifically? Where's the quality connection? So how do we know that metadata makes an impact on sales? The, the primary source for this is Nielsen, now NPD. Uh, they released a report back at the end of 2016 called The Importance of Metadata for Discovery and Sales. If you've never read it, I highly recommend you grab a copy or let me know if you need a copy. Uh, it explains how metadata actually can directly impact the sales of your books, and it goes into the detail of a, of a one-year study 
on how data, actual metadata, was a uh, there's a direct correlation between the quality of the metadata and the sales of those books. Essentially, what it comes down to and what the what this study shows is that more metadata and better quality metadata is the rule. The more you can do, the better you can do, the better your sales can be. As my colleague uh, Christina Radke over at NetGalley says, sending out your title without good metadata is like throwing it into a bin of books and just hoping that somebody will pull it out randomly. So with the importance of metadata in mind, I decided last summer to do a bit of testing and see how retailers actually handle the metadata that they're sent. I contacted three uh, of our clients and I asked them if they would like to participate in my little test, which they kindly agreed to do. And we chose a set of titles from each publisher. They were backlist titles that had already had data in the marketplace, and we went through an in-depth metadata assessment on each one. Now, these books included general nonfiction, uh, YA fiction, a graphic novel, a few cookbooks. Each of them had some interesting metadata, and each of them gave us some opportunities to test how that metadata was utilized by the different online book websites. Now, we updated the metadata for all of these titles extensively, and we ensured that we were changing enough metadata that we could track the changes uh, across the different sites. And I'd like to share with you some of generalized observations and recommendations that I uh, have drawn from this study to help you better impact your own metadata in the future. To cover the gamut of websites, I chose these six as my test bed. Now, these sites include the largest online retailer, two main competitors to that retailer, an independent bookstore, an international uh, Canadian bookstore, and the largest online book discovery and discussion platform. So my goal was to see how these websites handle the metadata that we send to them. Now, <clears throat> please know that I share this information in the interest of metadata quality and transparency. It's not an effort to call out uh, or uh, designate any of these sites as being bad. Uh, we all have metadata challenges in our industry. They just surface in different ways uh, for all. So the first thing that I was interested to see was how long it took for the metadata changes that we sent for these titles to appear on the different websites. As you can see, Amazon was the quickest with the changes all appearing on the site within 24 hours. Now, this is not a broad and scientific study by any stretch of the imagination, and we had multiple publisher clients uh, we have had multiple pub publisher clients in the past who have to wait longer for their data to appear. But one day is a pretty standard time frame for how quickly metadata appears on the Amazon site. Barnes & Noble took about one week on average to update the data, but there's a good reason for that. They actually have a manual vetting process for the data that they put on the site. Barnes & Noble actually seems to care about how their data looks, as we'll see later, but that uh, that pro does come with a bit more lag time. Goodreads was pretty quick to uh, set the title data up. Uh, it took one day for one of our publishers and four days for another. However, one title from the second publisher still wasn't updated many weeks later, uh, as, ha as were three titles from the third publisher. So uh, this could be a data issue that I'm not aware of, but that's what I saw in the test. Uh, Indigo also took about a week to import the title data, but their import process was also very manual. I talked to a representative over there, and this may have changed since that point in the late, late summer of last year, and they said that at the time that Onyx files are converted into an Excel format that then is imported into their database, and that process takes more time, and it had to be done manually, and the queue was fairly big. So they were working on an automated process for that, and hopefully that automated process is coming about. Um, I, I think that that manual process can be fairly problematic if, uh, if, it is, if the intention is to bring in a lot of products. Powell's Books, unfortunately, didn't update any of the metadata that we sent from these publishers. After more than two weeks, I kind of stopped looking. Uh, now, that might be just a problem with their import or a problem when the test was done, uh, but given the other issues with the metadata that I see at Powell's website, I'd call this pretty much part of the course for their site, unfortunately. And Walmart took about five days to update the data for the titles on their site. But again, their updates were inconsistent. And even though the title data for each publisher was sent in a single file, they actually managed to not update about half of each publisher's title records, uh, despite the fact they all came together. So I really have no idea why. And it's, it's kind of a black box there as to what might be going on. So with all that in mind, let's look at how the different sites handle product data when they do ingest it and give some insights hopefully into what you might be able to expect with your own data that you send to these sites. 
Now I'm going to do this in order of what I would consider to be the best quality to the worst, but that's obviously very subjective. And again, I'm not trying to call anybody out. It's just trying to trying to show you who I think is is doing a pretty good job with the data that you sent. So for Barnes and Noble, I'm actually very impressed with their data quality. They seem to have a lot of care and concern about the quality of the data that goes up. Uh, they do include all of the major pieces of, of descriptive copy, including things that other people don't, other sites don't. So the description, the author bio, uh, book reviews, the excerpt, and the table of contents even. Uh, in addition to that, they have a series name on the product page that's linked, so you can go and find do a search and uh, see other books in the same series. Uh, they include the edition if that's uh, provided, and they have a very clean design. It seems uh, not not as many ads, not as much clutter on the page. They really do seem to care quite a bit about that. I mean, just kind of look at this. You know, their description is nicely formatted. Uh, the additional content is clearly marked in nice tabs that are easy to navigate, and the reviews are called out in a unique color. Now, I'm not going to gush like a fanboy or something, but I do think from a metadata, metadata perspective, Barnes & Noble is doing this very well. I will nitpick a little bit. Uh, they do have duplicate reviews sometimes and inconsistent display on certain things. Some of that is due to how data is provided to them. Uh, but I think that in the end, this does come back to the uh, to the uh, site itself, not necessarily only to the publisher. And longer text like book descriptions and, and author bios and things have to be, they're always hidden. You have to uh, click on a, a little link to expand them out. And that applies to everything. Uh, all the long form descriptive copy, which I think from a, a user perspective is just a little bit too much work uh, to expect people to do more clicking that way. All right, let's switch to Amazon. So unlike the other sites, Amazon includes pretty much everything, almost everything that you give them um, with a couple of exceptions. So they do include the description, the author bio, reviews, an excerpt if you provide that in your Onyx file. Uh, the they are the only retailer that shows the publisher's comment, which is a uh, informational field that you can provide with uh, with inf you know, details about the book. So if you're if you're wanting to put accessibility content or things like that in there, you could you could make that kind of note here in the publisher's comment. Uh, they do include flap and back panel copy. They have a series name. They have the edition, and all of that kind of detailed stuff. However, their data is still not as good as Barnes and Noble's, in my opinion. So the design is very cluttered, as you probably know. There's a lot of uh, a lot of ads and things like that. There's also a lot of extra copy that's hidden by a link, you know, see all editorial reviews, which really isn't an accurate description uh, and it's easy to miss. So if you, you know, are looking for a book excerpt, you actually have to click on this see all editorial reviews, which may not be very intuitive. Uh, plus like Barnes and Noble, you have to click on read more to read their excerpts and other things. So uh, there's just not as much. And then they don't also, unlike Barnes and Noble, also don't include the table of contents. Um, which I think would be very beneficial for products that are, you know, nonfiction products on the on every site. So while we're talking about Amazon, though, I'd like to discuss keywords. Uh, keywords are a big deal at Amazon. Keywords at Amazon have been through a lot of changes as well, and there's some confusion that's uh, come up over the last couple of years. So in November of 2018, Amazon introduced a new limit of 250 bytes or characters of keyword data, and they said that any product with more than that limit would have all of their keywords completely ignored. There was a lot of confusion about this requirement and about whether or not Amazon was actually applying it. So uh, Amazon recently, though, addressed the confusion that came with the policy, and they've clarified the requirements again. So the new standard is that Amazon will send out the first 210 bytes of keyword data that you send, ignoring any delimiters and spaces automatically. And then keywords beyond that 210 byte limit, but below a 2000 byte limit, will be ignored. However, if you provide more than 2,000 bytes, everything will be ignored. Now note that this also means that keyword phrases mean less to Amazon than the individual words themselves. Because they're removing the delimiters, they don't care about a keyword phrase. Their machine learning algorithms will automatically combine words that are provided into phrases on its own based on search effectiveness and how their search is, is uh, using it. It also means that there's no need to repeat specific words in order to create your own phrases. So you know, Japanese cooking and Japanese ingredients can be reduced down to Japanese cooking ingredients because of three separate words that can be combined together by the machine learning system in whatever ways are necessary. Now, just remember that other retailers that currently take or are likely to begin taking keywords in the future may not have the same approach and actually don't have the same approach to keywords. So be careful about changing all of your keywords just to meet these new Amazon requirements. But I think there's some benefits here if you're looking to get as much bang for your buck in that 210 bytes to consider 
what you can do on that front with the keywords you send to Amazon. In other news, Amazon's now accepting Onyx 3. <laughs> this is great. I'm sure most of you probably heard this already. It's been ongoing for a while. Um, but with this change, Amazon says that they'll actually also start to accept more metadata fields in the future, such as book awards information. So we can all hope that this is a, a positive move forward for the entire industry and other retailers will follow suit and hopefully we'll have uh, we'll have more Onyx 3 capabilities and, and functionality uh, throughout the industry, especially here in North America. Uh, let's switch to Goodreads. So Goodreads has decent data, even if it is a bit limited. They only show the description, the author bio, the series, and the edition. However, they have no reviews. They don't have a, an excerpt. There's no table of contents or additional content uh, of any kind. Also, the publisher's content can easily be overwritten by site editors and other people, which I don't think pref is very preferable. I think publishers should have control over what content about their books shows up on sites like this. Now, in some ways, this is to be expected by the nature of the website. Now, that, that being said, it would be nice for the manufacturer just to have control uh, for there to be uh, and for there to be more metadata that's being sent by that publisher. Indigo does show the description, the author bio, and the reviews, so that's good. Uh, however, their data does have a lot of other issues. So if you send your reviews individually and not in one combined field, their system only shows the last uh, the last review in the list. So if you're doing reviews correctly in Onyx, it actually is problematic in the Indigo system. Uh, for some reason, uh, emphasis tags, EM tags, have their italic style removed on the website style sheet. Uh, so if you go look at a, a book description that has uh, italics, you know, you know, emphasis italics around a, a word, it's actually just, it's not italicized at all. Uh, paragraph tags are automatically replaced with a single BR tag, a break tag in the import process, which can cause problems with the design, the layout of your book descriptions and other long form copy. They're also the only retailer who doesn't show the series name anywhere on the site, uh, which I think is an important piece of information. Uh, and they also don't show the edition of the book. So if it's a second edition, a special edition of some kind, they're not showing that information. I think this information is helpful and important for people when they're searching for, pro for products. Overall, this is concerning to me, but surprisingly not the worst metadata I see. Uh, I'm hopeful that this will improve greatly when the metadata ingestion process that we talked about earlier is more automated and hopefully uh, doesn't require uh, immediate format changes. Uh, Walmart is an interesting test case in books. Now, obviously, they're a big competitor to Wal to uh, Amazon in kind of the general market, the general manufacturing market, you know, product market, but books are kind of an interesting situation. Their site does show the book description, but they also show the short description in many cases, which can be a little a little confusing or a little duplicative. Uh, so it's it's not really that you know that great. Uh, they do show series name as well, but they have no descriptive copy. It, other than that, it's all mashed together with no headings. They, they don't show author bios or reviews or excerpts or edition info. Uh, and the product data section does show the publication month and year, but not the day for some reason. So you just get a month and a year, not an actual day of the publication. I also have a lot of issues finding products based on their ISBN on the site. Uh, and often the new descriptive copy that you send to them is just tacked onto the end instead of replacing copy that was there before. So it can add a bunch of extra copy to it. Now I put PALS on last on my list because of how the metadata looks. Uh, and honestly, in many ways, it's just unreadable and unbearable for me as a metadata person. Uh, while Walmart sometimes has duplicate copy, PALS has that in spades and also has a ton of other weird copy that I couldn't figure out where it all came from. Regardless of that, some titles mysteriously actually have no descriptive copy at all, despite that copy being sent by publishers uh, to the PALS system. And PALS also doesn't show the edition information and they don't show an excerpt or a table of contents, which again, I would, I would prefer to that happen. The biggest issue though seems to be their importing process. So on a large number of titles with no apparent consistency, ampersands inside the book descriptive copy are switched to the word and, uh, which causes a lot of problems for HTML entities. Uh, I mean, if you look at this, this is pretty much unreadable. There's no way to to see how this could be readable to a, a consumer. <clears throat> so as you can see, metadata on retailer websites still has a long way to go. Some sites are doing a really great job. Some are doing a decent job. Um, and those are definitely better than five years ago. Uh, we'll come back to some best practices and suggestions that might help you mitigate some of these issues later, but I think it's important for you to consider how your data will look when it actually gets put up on those sites. 
So I'd like to switch gears and talk about some of the other challenges that publishers are encountering with their data, uh, beyond the challenge of getting retailers to show your data and to show it well on the different sites. Now, the first challenge I'd like to address is data overriding and ownership. Your data should be your data. You would think that the manufacturer of a product would be the one who has control over the product data. However, that's not the case. Everyone else kind of seems to think the data is theirs. And at Firebrain, we've been tracking metadata and product issues for a long time, and we've seen publishers lose control of their metadata for a variety, a large variety of reasons. Uh, cover images are changed, descriptions are overwritten, inconsistent copy is sent for some reason, old data is sent, uh, and more. This happens with distributors, it happens with wholesalers, it happens with data aggregators as well. Now, normally, we would prefer that this right here be the standard supply chain for metadata. The publisher has the data, they send that official data out to the different locations where it needs to go, and that's that. Single source of truth, the publisher is the source. The problem is that this flowchart is not accurate to the real world. The real world is a whole lot messier than that. What you give to a retailer can easily be overwritten by somebody else. In some cases, it's done days or even hours after you send out the updated data yourself. Uh, it, it's almost like a wild west out there. Distributors, metadata aggregators, wholesalers, and even outside sources like authors can sometimes provide data to your retailers that overwrites what you as a publisher sent them yourself. One of our clients ran headlong into this last year. An old distributor in the UK sent Amazon title data for 400 of that publisher's titles. Now, it was a mistake on the distributor's part, but normally not something that would be a problem. Amazon should have checked, but Amazon gave that distributor control over 400 titles and then started sending orders to them for new copies. And the distributor obviously rejected the orders, but Amazon never checked with the publisher to ensure that the vendor of record was supposed to change in the first place. And it took a lot of effort on the publisher side to get the titles returned to them as the supplier. These kinds of issues happen all the time, and unfortunately, I don't know that they're going to go away. But the overriding of your data can cause a lot of problems for your products in the marketplace. Now, as for practical recommendations for how you can combat metadata overriding and ownership, I have only two. The first is that you send your trading partners regular monthly feeds of your entire list. Monthly feeds, especially to Amazon, can help you mitigate some of the issues that come with other sources overriding your data. It doesn't have to be done monthly, of course, it can be quarterly. It's just on a regular basis, sending a full data feed of all of your book data is a good idea to help kind of mitigate some of these problems. The goal is to just to periodically make sure that your data is correct. Now, some, some retailers won't like this and don't want you to do it, so make sure you check with them first. But having that, you know, that source of data come out one more time or on a regular basis is a great, a great way of kind of helping the overriding issue for sure. And my second suggestion is if you send out metadata feeds yourself and you have your own Vendor Central or Amazon Advantage account, then when you're sending out metadata for a new book for the very first time, send it to Amazon before you send it to anyone else. Amazon prioritizes certain metadata sources and even has an internal ranking system for them. So if your metadata gets to Amazon from someone else before it comes from you directly, Amazon will likely make that other source the data, the owner of your data, and may not accept metadata changes from your Onyx feed directly. This doesn't have to happen a long time before you send data to everyone else. Usually just a day or two is fine, but it's better to do that than to have to fight for control later of the product data. So send to Amazon first before you give the data to anyone else, if that's at all possible. The second challenge that I want to address is third-party sellers. So Amazon opened up this can of worms back in 2017, and it's had a dramatic impact on publishers of all types and sizes, especially here in the U.S. Now, we at Firebrand have been tracking third-party sellers for the last three years, and I'd like to share some data that we have collected about them that might be helpful in explaining their impact. This data all comes from our Eloquence on Alert platform, which collects data about titles on retailer sites daily, including on Amazon. The, stat, the stats all come from a list of about 40,000 titles that we've been tracking from more than 50 publishers. Third-party sellers on Amazon have won the buy box on about 50% of these 40,000 titles at least one time. So at least half of the products that are out there uh, have a third-party seller taking the buy box uh, you know, at least once. However, on any given day, third-party sellers win the buy box on about 15% of titles. 
Now, this percentage of buy box wins has been stable since we first started collecting the data. Obviously, the data comes from our specific set of titles that we're collecting data on. So I'm trying to extrapolate this out to all pr products, but uh, we'll take it with a grain of salt. But 15% on average on, a, on any given day, about 15% of our titles are being taken by a third party seller. Now, we've tracked almost 7,500 individual third party sellers in the Amazon marketplace. And this is influenced by the publishers and the titles we're tracking again. So they're definitely more than that. Matter of fact, if you if you look at some online sources, there there are you know, you know tens of thousands of third party sellers in the Amazon marketplace. Not all of them taking or selling books, but uh, but we've tracked 7,500 individual sellers that does that do take books. Of those 7,500 sellers, 43% of them have taken the buy box fewer than 10 times. This means that a large percentage of third-party sellers that are selling books are very small players and not necessarily making a large impact on your book sales individually. However, this also means that many publishers are playing whack-a-mole with all of these third-party sellers, trying to get the smaller sellers uh, removed from the store or figure out who they are or try to fix the issue of how they're taking the buy box. The majority of buy box wins are taken though by a small group of sellers. The top 30 third party sellers make up 50% of buy box wins. That's a very large percentage. And those top 30 are a very specific list of, of uh, sellers. So these are the top seven sellers in our list um, from recent months and what percent of the buy box wins each has. Again, this data is limited to the titles we're tracking. So while we're not necessarily, the, these are not necessarily the top sellers overall, they definitely are at the top on our list. Some of these are actually people you would recognize or might pay attention to, like Book Depository US is an Amazon owned company uh, that sells through a third party seller marketplace seller system uh, titles that are basically from Amazon. Uh, there's other ones on here as well that you know, if you do some research, they're, uh, they're kind of interesting to dig into. Now, in addition to that, we found that for a single publisher's books, the buy box is primarily given to only a handful of specific third party sellers. That's probably due to how those sellers acquire their stock or to the genres of the books that they prefer to sell. For example, one publisher in our system has had their titles taken by about 900 distinct third-party sellers, but one of those sellers accounts for 21% of all of that publisher's third-party sales. Some other important details to think about when you're looking at how third-party sellers are selling and what the, what the impact on your books is, the average sale price for each book offered by a third-party seller was about 34% off of the publisher list price. For comparison, the average sale price set by Amazon for the same titles is only 26% off the list price. So third-party sellers are setting sale prices that are 8% to 10% lower than Amazon sale prices on average. And the, this difference is, is, is hovers around 10% for us across the last couple of years. Another interesting data point that we've noticed that there's, there seems to be a correlation between the sale price and the sales rank. While lower priced books do tend to have better sales rank kind of in general, this is especially true for titles that are not being sold by a third party seller. So when a third party seller has the buy box, even at a lower price, the sales rank for the title at that moment is consistently worse. This could be due to decreased sales through those sort of third party sellers. It may also be an interesting effect of how Amazon sales rank algorithms are working. Uh, but sales rank can change on a regular basis, as you'll see here in just a minute. And finally, about half of the third party sellers that we track are fulfilled and shipped by Amazon. The other half handled, handled their own fulfillment. What's interesting is during coronavirus, this changed dramatically. We saw a massive increase in the number of, of, uh, fulfillment, of third party sellers taking the buy box when, when they were doing their own fulfillment. Amazon kind of dropped off the map. They didn't want to continue fulfilling books either for themselves or for third-party sellers. So for a couple of months, the last couple of months, we saw a massive increase in that. Uh, and I will uh, I'll make sure there's a link. We put a report out, a research, research report out recently uh, on our website that shows some of this data. So I'll, I'll make sure to share that with you guys after the webinar. Now, third-party sellers are definitely a challenge and they they may be a very big challenge, but they may not be the biggest challenge that you specifically have as a publisher. Another challenge that publishers have is not having clear, recognizable, and well-known branding. So I want to I give you a story. In 1875, the state of Texas decided that it was time to build a new Capitol building. Now, to pay for this new building, the state bartered with an investment firm in Chicago and gave that investment firm 
3 million acres of public land in the Texas panhandle in exchange for constructing this brand new Capitol building. The land was formed into a massive ranch that ended up being the home of about 150,000 cattle. Now, cows are usually branded with a symbol to show who the owner is. Brands were unique to each ranch, and those brands were closely guarded. Cattle wrestlers, though, were known to sneak into a herd at night and rebrand a cow by changing the symbol slightly to make it look like another brand. That allowed them to steal cattle that would otherwise have been easily identifiable and make it make people think that they were actually their cows. This new ranch's trail driver, uh, his name was Ab Blocker, had uh, had to come up with a brand for the cattle that was hard for cattle rustlers to adjust. So he came up with the XIT brand. The combination of symbols and the XIT brand made it harder to change than other brands were, harder to duplicate, and also very durable. So as a result of this branding, the ranch was named the XIT Ranch, and now it has an enduring place in the history of Texas. So why am I telling you this story about XIT? Well, I, I think, I would like to think, I'd like to give you a bit of different perspective about branding, because publishing has a branding problem. The problem is that consumers, by and large, don't know or even care about your publishing company's brand. In essence, they care more about eating the cow than they care about what brand it has on its rump. In our research over the last few months, we've found clear evidence that brand recognition is a key indicator of success on Amazon. So in the wake of COVID-19, we've seen Amazon dramatically increasing the number of titles on which they're making day-by-day -day adjustments to sale prices. This increased fiddling with the sale price can actually mean big swings in the perceived value of your books. However, we've also seen that on books by well-known authors or on well-known imprints and brands, the sale price ha as a percentage of the list price stays higher. In many cases, the sale price can be as high as 90% of the publisher's list price. Now remember the average sale price I showed you earlier uh, on Amazon is about 75% of list. So that, that's a, another 15% or 20, 25% difference, 15% you know, difference on top of that, you know, on top of the, uh, the you know, kind of the general average sale price. Lower sale prices hurt your brand. It reduces the perceived value of your products in the eyes of consumers. Also, shopper, shoppers are tired. They, they want the decision to be easy and recognizable brands with good metadata and good reviews are going to make more sales just because they don't require as much effort to research and there's something that clicks in the mind of, of a consumer. Now, recognizable branding is not all sunshine and roses. We've seen a big increase in counterfeiting over the last five years or 10 years, including some very high profile cases like the two here on the screen. Publishers with recognizable brands that are not protecting those brands can be easy pickings for counterfeiters. So how do you protect against that? I suggest for one step, consider I can suggest you consider utilizing the Amazon brand registry. While the primary stated purpose of the brand registry is to help brands protect their intellectual property, including reporting and removing counterfeiting counterfeit products, there are actually some additional benefits that come with being a registered brand. And I'm not a, I'm not a fanboy of Amazon or anything like that. I'm just trying to help you understand how the brand registry could help you not only with your potential branding issues, but also help you with better metadata. The biggest benefit of the brand registry is A plus content. A plus content are those special from the publisher sections that you see on some pages. This is only available to publishers who are in the Amazon brand registry or who participate in one of uh, another, a couple of other exclusivity programs. These additional marketing sections can provide more images, more explanatory text, and better details about your products. And as you can see, they can also be designed in a lot of different ways, depending on the book you have and the needs that you have. In addition to that A-plus content, being part of the brand registry allows you to create store pages for your books. Now, these store pages can have a very simple address, like Amazon.com slash dummies, allowing you to use them in marketing and to easily direct customers to those pages. And then another benefit of the brand registry is the ability to buy sponsored brand ads. These are special ad sections that show up above the search results and point to specific products from your brand. As you can see here, just like sponsored product ads, you can buy branding for different keywords. That allows your products to show up in conjunction with competitors' titles, like the books here from Elsevier showing up in a search for dummies books. 
Now, as with everything Amazon does, there are some caveats to using the brand registry. If you're in the U.S., you have to be on the U.S. trademark principal registry, not the supplementary registry. Uh, be sure you apply for the correct brand or correct trademark. In Canada, you have to be registered with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. And in both cases, it can take a lot of long time to get registered. And the brand that you use has to contain words, letters, or numbers. It can't just be an image. Uh, there have also been some reports from some publishers that uh, reporting violations to Amazon can cause some problems, including problems with Ingram when they're distributing to the offending seller. So be careful about how you report those. Make sure you work with your distributor to ensure that you're not going to be stepping on toes or having issues. And also, from what I've heard, the integration with Amazon Advantage is not that great. Apparently, it's better with uh, other uh, with Seller Central or Vendor Central uh, on the Amazon side. In the end, your mileage may vary, but there might not be too many downsides to trying the brand registry, especially if you have a very recognizable brand or you're building a recognizable brand and you want to make sure that that brand is being protected. I'd like to end up uh, in this piece of it with another story. So a story about Sam. Sam was also a Texas rancher and he also had a lot of cattle. The difference was that he was kind of headstrong and independent and he decided that he didn't want to brand his cows. Other ranchers and cattle wrestlers actually had a penchant for finding Samuel's cows because they didn't have brands and just branding them as their own. And the result was that a herd of 400 cattle that he acquired in 1845 had not grown any larger after 11 years of dedicated maintenance. Sam's last name has now become synonymous with headstrong, independent people, Mavericks. Now, being a maverick is not a bad thing generally. Most entrepreneurs are mavericks, and I assume that many of you listening to the webinar today are mavericks too. But Sam learned the hard way that not using metadata on your product can keep you from being successful. So don't be like Sam. The fourth challenge I want to talk about is the biggest challenge I think that publishers face, and that's that they're missing too much. You're missing opportunities. You're missing, missing issues with your titles. Uh, in on the different retail sites that are out there if you're not watching for them specifically. The issues and the opportunities that you happen to catch with any manual checks are guaranteed to be a small percentage of what's actually happening to your titles. We talked a little while ago about metadata overriding issues. In 2012, the Book Industry Study Group commissioned a report called the Development, Use, and Modification of Book Product Metadata. You can find this on their website. The study found that 95% of publishers say that their metadata is altered without their knowledge on retail sites by third parties like distributors and metadata aggregators. However, the study also found that only 36% of publishers were checking their metadata on, on retailer sites. This number may have changed more, uh, changed more in the last seven or eight years, but I can guarantee you that the majority of publishers are still not checking their titles regularly or watching what's happening to them. In an interview with Hockey News in 1983, Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. It's true in hockey, and it's also true in data. Watching your data on retailer websites is imperative. And this is not just about third-party sellers. Yeah, those are important, but there's a lot of other inf information, a lot of important information that you need to pay attention to on retailer sites. List price and sale price issues are constantly happening and changing. Buy buttons can disappear. Entire titles can disappear. Uh, review counts, review stars, and sales rank. There are a lot of different things that can change. And this brings us back to our story from the beginning of the webinar. How did this publisher increase their sales by 42% in 2019? They did that by watching their data on retail sites, especially on Amazon, and proactively addressing issues and opportunities they encountered. And they're not the only publisher that's doing this and finding success. I've talked to numerous publishers who are taking a more proactive approach, digging into retailer data issues, and all of them have found it to be extremely effective. So what does a proactive approach look like? Well, I'm going to close with some best practices and suggestions for you to take home and apply right now to what you're doing in your publishing company. My first suggestion is that you assign someone to work on data as their full-time job. Every publisher I've talked to who has had success in dealing with retailer issues in sizes ranging from 400 titles to, to thousands of titles to tens of thousands of titles has assigned at least one person in a full-time role to tackling those issues. And it's definitely a full-time job. One such person uh, that I talked to talking about the issues that crop up on a daily basis told me there's a new hell every day. Finding issues, reporting them, addressing internal causes, addressing external causes, tracking the solutions to completion, all of that takes time. And a person being assigned is very important. 
In addition to that one person, though, you're going to need to empower more of your team to help them address the opportunities and the issues that arise. When a third party seller is selling what appears to be a counterfeit book, your piracy and legal team needs to be involved. The same is true when other issues and opportunities arise. If key indicators like the sale price or the number of reviews are changing, your marketing team, team may want to jump in on that. And when a metadata problem is found, the editorial team might need to weigh in on how to make a change to the data. The one person responsible for watching the issues can't always do everything on their own. So they need a team behind them. It takes a village. Of course, on smaller teams, that one person may need to be actively involved in the metadata delivery and optimization, as well as in online marketing. Uh, these tasks really do mesh well with the job of fixing issues and jumping on opportunities. Just make sure that as they put more hats on, they also get the support and the assistance that they need. My third suggestion is that you prioritize the quality of the data that you send out. Your metadata is arguably your company's most valuable non-people resource. As I said at the beginning, different kinds of data are becoming more and more important in publishing, but all of that other data has a direct impact on your sales, has, has less of a direct impact on your sales as your metadata does. While there's no way to guarantee more sales, providing better metadata, providing more metadata, and providing up-to-date metadata is likely one of your most effective approaches. So earlier on, I showed you what the different retailers will utilize. First and foremost, you should be sending out as much data as you possibly can, but here are a few other things to consider looking at more closely in your data. Cover images are very important, but publishers often run into issues getting them right. When I spoke to the rep from Indigo, they said that they have to delete a very large number of cover images every year because publishers send them uh, things that are too small or that don't have the necessary quality. So here's some basic specs for those of you who are trying to send out cover images uh, that we give to our clients here at Firebrand, which should meet the requirements of most trading partners. Essentially, just be sure you have an image that's large and high quality, but don't forget to ensure that it's also readable as a thumbnail. I also recommend that you check your cover images at the different retailers on a regular basis to ensure that they're present and that they don't have issues and that they haven't been changed out with something else. Look Inside is also a great way for consumers to look at your books before they buy. This is especially helpful for complex titles with a lot of interior design work. Our Eloquence on Alert research has shown that sale price on Amazon as a percentage of list price stays higher when a book has Look Inside. So Look Inside actually helps you have a higher price point on the sale price point on your book uh, than you would otherwise. If you have the ability, always provide a Look Inside file. Now, regardless of whether you have Look Inside or not, I also recommend sending your retailers some interior images of your book. These interior shots are used by both Amazon and Barnes and Noble and can be just as effective as Look Inside on highly designed titles. Don't forget to send a book excerpt as well, especially for fiction and general nonfiction titles where the interior images are not really as effective as the text of the first chapter or another piece of the book would be. A promotional headline can also make a big difference in your sales. It tells consumers immediately what your book is about and why they should keep looking. Uh, no retailers utilize the Onyx field right now, so just add it to the top of your book description, put it in bold, make it stand out, have something there to catch the attention of the person who just came into your page for the first time. Also, bisect categories are something you should consider tweaking as well. Many publishers do this as part of their regularly scheduled title assessments. Uh, but watch the sales ranks of the sales rank of your books in the different categories that it has on Amazon and consider trying to get that title into other categories when the sales rank in some of those secondary categories start to drop off. Just a quick note about tracking sales rank, both in the main books category and in those lower categories, Amazon sales rank can change constantly. And over time, the sales rank for a title tends to follow this kind of sawtooth pattern that you see in this graph. However, the key is to look at the overall trend for the book, either in the main books category or in a specific subcategory that you're focusing on, and then to assess the overall health of the book in that way. This is a great example, actually, of where your daily data collection can come in really handy. You can see at the beginning of this book, the sawtooth pattern was very big, wide swings, and then as the title came into the marketplace, that tightened up a lot. And then as the book kind of started to go toward the long tail, uh, it spread out just a little bit as well. In addition, it's helpful to look at sales rank in conjunction with other things, calendar events, marketing campaigns. Here we can see that this title sold really well in the lead up to Christmas and then dropped off precipitously right afterwards. And here we can see the sales rank pattern for a children's book about St. Patrick's Day. 
we learned from this title that the title's sales rank and its visibility in sales started to increase as early as July, as sorry, as January. And that can inform our marketing efforts for this and other books next year as well. Again, what kinds of marketing could you run quickly if a back title, backlist title suddenly jumps to a higher sales rank? Would you even know that that was happening until a month later when you look at your sales reporting? Probably not, but watching sales rank and seeing the averages and seeing how the trends are working can be really helpful. Moving on to my fourth suggestion, refresh your data often. Your metadata is evergreen. One publisher told me that every month, they look at all the titles that were published in that month in the three previous years, and they spend a little bit of time on each of those titles, updating the metadata, adding new and relevant information, fixing issues that they find. Whether you follow that kind of schedule or something else, we saw at the beginning of this session that more metadata and better metadata is a key contributor to higher sales. In this kind of yearly evergreen refresh, you, you might update the author bio, you might add awards, the author or the book of one, maybe add some new reviews if you have them, adjust the keywords, tweak the book description, add new comp titles, and more. Think about what's going on in the news or in the culture and in the specific genre or topic that the book is in and use that to help you create better data. If the title doesn't have interior images or look inside, then try to add those. It's also important to note that Amazon's search engine works in a similar way to how Google works, specifically in that it pays attention to titles that are being updated. Pushing out metadata updates can be an effective way to ensure that your titles stay relevant and visible. My last suggestion is this, keep an eye on your titles in the marketplace. If you're able to do it, use automation to your advantage. There's no way for your one person or even your team of people to stay on top of every title in your list every day. And there are a variety of tools out there that can help you with that process. But find a good title performance monitoring tool that can help you uh, help alert you when things go wrong. If you're unable to use an automated monitoring tool, then take advantage of the free tools that are out there. So I'll give an example here. Just a few weeks ago, we released a, a free tool called PageNexter that will be helpful for this very purpose. You can provide PageNexter with a list of website links and it will open up those links for you in a window that allows you to easily next through that list. Instead of opening a bunch of browser tabs, you can just put all your products in here, hit the next button, and see how all of your titles are doing across the different sites. Also, if you, if you provide it with an ASIN, it'll open up Amazon pages, and if you provide it with an ISBN, it will open Barnes & Noble pages. However you choose to watch your titles, whatever you choose to do on that front, I highly recommend that you take the time and you do it. And now we'll take questions. Thanks, Joshua. So I have one question submitted by viewer 34. And the question is, will Amazon ignore just the keywords if there's more than 2,000 bytes or will they reject the whole record? They will not reject the whole record. What they've said in, in their most recent uh, policy is that they will just ignore the keywords completely if it has more than 2,000 bytes. And the other two are more like comments. One of them is from Tori. Tori said, I have actually just noticed that Indigo does seem to have serious information on some titles. Uh, Tori provided a link and Tori said, see the lane wins love series. This is the first time I've seen that I've seen this. Might be a new feature. Something yeah, else. That's, that's great. Yeah, and hopefully that, that's an indicator of good good things to come at Indigo. That's awesome. Exactly. And Carolyn uh, also made a comment and she says, if publishers don't want their data changed by retailers, I would recommend they ensure they send correct and consistent metadata in the first place. Uh, yeah, I, there's, there's something to that. <laughs> and Caroline knows what she's talking about. I, I think that when it comes down to it, uh, it, it's a both and. You know, you definitely need to send correct and consistent data, data in the first place, uh, but you, there will be changes. Changes happen all the time, and it's not necessarily something you can you can avoid. So that, that's why I do recommend doing uh, you know a major update of your data on a regular basis, send out, you know, once a month or something, send out a, a full feed so you can ensure that whatever changes might have been made uh, actually can be overwritten by your good data. 